You know how sometimes someone will say, well, what are you reading? Um, oh, yeah, well, I'm reading, you know, War and Peace, and I haven't quite got to the end of it yet. But this is a book that I intend to say I will never stop reading. It's a book that you can pick up and read over and over again. And each time, I can assure you, I think I'm at maybe 25 now, um, there'll be that, that sweet lift of empowerment and belonging that will um, allow you to sing your now proud and true. Thank you so much, Barb and Lori, for giving us all this gift. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for coming. And I have to give a huge thank you to the Wakefield Library for sponsoring um, this book launch and to Doug MacArthur for filming it. Um, and this community for being a community that absolutely embraces new artists. So thank you. Um, and, oh, I, Ilsa and Ruthie. I, Ruthie and Ilsa have been tremendous in just putting out these daily posts in the Wakefield News, if you've seen them, and like a new post every day. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you. Um, <laughs> So uh, Ilsa had asked if I would speak about the story of how the book came to be. And so, you know, I, I have been a writer all of my life, but I never had the courage to publish anything before. And so um, I had gone on this writing retreat in 2018 in Toronto, and by the end of the weekend, we had to produce something to share. And so that was a lot of pressure. Um, but I had come armed, have this intimate connection with words. And so I had come armed with this um, binder full of you know, scrap papers and this is and that's from, from over the years, past writings. And, um, and so I ended up playing Tetris all weekend with words and phrases. And um, around the concept this, that a, a very dear friend of mine, Joanne Ewing, had seated in me um, a few years earlier, which was to think of life as a song and the part that you play in it. And so by the end of the weekend, I had managed to produce the original version, which I will read to you a little bit later. Um, and, when I, and, so, and it was very well received. And so they encouraged me to do something with it. And so when I got home, life took hold and the poem sat on a shelf. And so it wasn't until um, September, or summer 2019, I had a wee detour hit my life, um, and it allowed for a pocket of time. And in that pocket of time, I got the poem back off the shelf. And so over the last couple of years, um, courted Barb <laughs> to be my illustrator because I'd seen the phenomenal work that she does. And it did take a bit of courting. Um, <laughs> Uh, in, but the entire process was very profoundly therapeutic for me because the community really came together and uh, flexed their creative muscles um, for this bigger purpose, which ended up being this book. And one of those women is here today, Brenda Atkinson, who's my um, editorial mentor, who played a significant role in the book, both books actually, and the website. Um, and we had this crazy idea in the beginning that we were just going to learn Adobe and put this in a print ready file and send it to a printer. Well, we were we put an ad out on the Wakefield News and Michael Cooper from Alcove uh, reached out and he said, yeah, he said, I don't know. He said, I think you better hire a graphic designer. <laughs> and so we did. We, we hired Rachel Saunders, who um, gave us a wonderful friends and family rate. Um, and and then we, we finally produced this, this piece of work. And during COVID, <laughs> and during a bunch of crazy times in our life, so um, we put, when we put it out to the beta readers, my colleagues, friends, and neighbors um, all had some feedback to make it more child-friendly. And that's why uh, the version that I'm going to read to you today, which was the original version, is different than um, the book that we, that we ended up producing. Um, so we needed, we decided we were going to self-launch. We decided we were going to self-publish because we wanted to put it out into the world in the same spirit that it had happened through networking. Um, and so we needed a website. And Anna Anderson, who um, was actually one of my first nature students when I was, uh, had started my nature program when my children were young, 
um, had just launched a, a business. And so I said, would you create my website? And I gave her raw material um, and text, and she created this incredible website. Um, so yeah, that's just a little bit about the, the story of, of how it came to be. And I, and I truly feel in my heart, if it wasn't for the village of people that had come together, that this very well could not have come to light. So thank you. So the nine thumbnail prints at the back um, uh, are part of it. And then at the very, very back of the book, we've put this clock set to one minute before the 11th hour. And there, there is layers in this book. And, and it, you know, ironically, uh, the 50 plus generation has really connected with this book. I'm, I'm part of that generation. Just uh, So um, that's been really wonderful, because that was our hope. Um, and when we did the layers with the, the thumbnails, we were thinking of schools, and we were thinking of wanting to have the children reflect, and, and but also adults, and just for us to reflect on the role that we play in other species' lives. Um, and there's this underlying message that runs through the entire book, which is this message of hope and responsibility. Um, and so I'm going to read uh, the Monarch page, which, it, which on it has, well, I'll, I'll show you. So it has a, a tiny seed of an acorn with an oak hovering over top, and then a monarch caterpillar and uh, a monarch butterfly. And so the, the back thumbnail reads like this. Butterflies are one example of a living thing that changes form and begins life again. Seeds contain all the instructions to grow into incredible things no one would ever imagine possible. Like all mammals, humans learn by watching others. Who you hang out with, what you listen to, and what you watch affects who you become. You can cause great things to happen at any age. It's time to bring all ideas forward that have the potential to bring us back in tune with the natural world. And so, you know, the implication running through all of the thumbnails is that regardless of age, we teach and we are taught. We inspire and we aspire. And we can make a difference in the corner of the world that we live in, in whatever small way that is. Um, and it's somewhat essential right now that we do that in order for our children and our grandchildren and generations to come have an environment in which to thrive. Um, and that's, you know, that's definitely um, interspersed through this book uh, in, in, in a light way, but um, it's, it's, it's one of the purposes behind writing it. Um, butterflies and frogs and dragonflies and seeds all change, uh, move from one state of being to another. And interestingly, humans are a species, one of the only species that can evolve within our existing lifetimes. And so we can make course corrections and modifications. Um, and it's, it's time that we do that. Um, so that's, that brings us back to that final image of the clock um, being one minute to the 11th hour, um, giving us that sense of hope, but um, also, just that, that sense of the time is upon us. Um, and so I will read the original version to you and then leave you with a last thought. If life was a song and I a note, I'd see a day as an instrument of time and I'd work to improve my playing of it well. Some days I'd make good music and on others I'd be glad no one hears. I'd spread kindness without expectation wherever I went leaving melodies to linger in my wake. If life was a song and I a note, I'd listen to the beat of my inner drum, recognizing my longings as an integral part of my composition. And I'd associate with performers who inspired me so that I might grow to be more than I ever thought I could be. If life was a song and I a note, I'd expect spans of time where I'd be off key all musicians practice in tune before they play the concert hall. 
Regardless, I'd stand tall and deliver my note with all that I am, knowing if I didn't, something would be missing, something that mattered. If life was a song and I a note, I'd appreciate you are a note too. And I'd listen, knowing even if you appeared discordant to my ears, you are instrumental to the song. I'd acknowledge all chords are carried on the latticework of the natural world, for no solo, duet, serenade, or symphony could exist without nature's stage. If life was a song, I'd be a note. I'd square my shoulders and sing my one note deeply and deliberately so that those who came after me would know this meant something to me. And with my entire being, I'd know I was part of a beautiful piece of music. has something oh, first. Sorry. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, just for me, as a, an ending thought for, for what I wanted to say was, I think it's very easy for us to think of the music that nature makes. And we can all have, you know, the rustling of the leaves and the trees, or even a, a cold winter night and the silence of that. Um, thinking of the contribution that we make to that song is something we ought to do. And because who we are, what we do, and how we do it makes a type of music that no one can replicate but us. So if in any small way we have inspired you today to reflect on the part you play in the song, whatever that might be, then we have done what we had hoped to do. Thank you. <laughs> Um, first of all, thank you so much uh, for coming to Lori Doan's book launch. A few years ago, when I read Lori's original poem, uh, the beauty and the truth in her words uh, just shone out and it just grabbed my heart. I think you might find that a little later when you hear the original. Uh, when she asked me if I would consider illustrating it, I thought, really? I'm not an artist, but after reading it and rereading it a few times, I decided to give it a try. I definitely had a lot of trepidation <laughs> to whether I could do it justice. Taking somebody's words and trying to illustrate what the writer sees and what is hidden behind those words is no easy task. My first pencil drawings were full of five lines staffs and musical notes and small pictures embedded throughout. We eventually rejected that style, but kept some of the ideas. It was really a process where Laurie and I bounced ideas off of each other until we got to the ones that felt just right. Uh, when I started painting, that's when the magic began. My first watercolor paintings were simpler because painting with watercolors was really new to me. Thank goodness for my art teachers. I had a variety of them in this area. As I progressed, the pictures kept taking on far more depth than turning into full page spreads. And sometimes I'd stop and I'd look at it and I'd be amazed that I actually had painted it. I realized then that the paintings were coming from my heart as well as my head. In order to put layers in the books, I think this was Laurie's idea of creating layers and layers so people could see different things. I began hiding a single musical note in each picture. Many of the five line staffs that were removed originally from the initial drawings um, were what I did is I tucked them in here and there throughout the pictures and you'll see them like on the fence posts in the hills and feathers. Yeah. Um, and once adults and kids alike love looking for these little hidden treasures. Um, when we were well on our way, we visited our talented graphic artist, Michael Cooper, who gave us a wonderful piece of advice. Stick to what you do well. And employ a graphic designer to bring the book together. This is where the talented Rachel Saunders stepped into the process. She artfully brought the words and the paintings into a digital format. Uh, 
she couldn't make it today, but thank you to Rachel for being so patient and so incredibly easy to work with. And so voila, it's ready for printing, right? <laughs> for me, learning to be an illustrator was hard at times. There were so many times that I said to myself, what do you think you're doing? You don't, you don't even know how to draw and paint well enough to illustrate a book. But I took it. All, it took all of my family and friends and their positive comments and support to make me see that I really am an artist and that I can illustrate a book. It took Lori Doan asking me to try, and it also took me believing in myself and then singing one, my one deep and deliberate note with truth and love and compassion and giving it to the world through my paintings. So, thank you. I just like to call attention to the beautiful way it's the book is put together, in that there is a, um, a splendid illustration and a line of the poem on each page, but then at the back of the book, uh, a cores corresponding with each of the lines and each of the illustrations, is a reflection, and. Um, I have my own copy now, but for a, for a few days I had the, the, the copy that Laurie gave to the library and I read the book over and over and I found that the, that the, com that reading, that stopping and, and reading the reflections really deepened the experience. The worst is when there's no questions. <laughs> I've already silenced my family. <laughs> yes? So how long was your process uh, from, from your dream of doing the book to, to when you started it? So the actual, the, the original version was 2018. And then um, uh, we, we kind of got slowed down a little bit along the way with some um, a little detour, but I'd say in earnest, we picked it up um, September 2020 and really worked at it until January. Mm -hmm. Well, we worked at the book until January um, and then the website and on the other pieces, the, edit the editing came after that. So yeah, I, yeah. September 2020 till yeah. April, wow. yeah. Wow. But we had it. We had it. We had a pocket of time, <laughs> so we, uh, yeah, we just made it happen. <laughs> Last little push, in a sense. Yeah, definitely some deadlines we, we put mm -hmm. on ourselves mm -hmm. to uh, to make that possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for coming today. Okay. Yes. Thank you. How, um, how do you and and uh, Barb know each other? Um, I had met Barb years ago, actually. Barb is a dear friend of mine, so it appeared as if we had just met through the book process, but we had not. And so I had met, I had met Barb, gosh, a long time ago now. I, I can't remember. My children were young. Yeah, um, they were just this. But I had, you know, been to her house many times, and she has incredible artwork that she has made, and so... I was like, no, no, you can do this. You can do this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's true. Serendipity. <laughs> serendipity. That's for mm. sure. I have a question. What, what, looking back, what did you find was the most difficult part of the process? Mm. <laughs> well, writing a book and illustrating a book is the beautiful part, that creative piece. Um, everything else was straight up learning curve. Um, we're on the other side of it now, but um, we just really had no idea. And we're like pre-technical, we're not very technical. And so we just 
managed along by asking a lot of questions and, and people in the community just coming up in spades really to help us. Like, for example, Michael, Michael Cooper, I put an ad in the Wakefield News and said, can anyone teach me how to do Adobe? <laughs> and Michael Cooper said, no, come to my house. We're going to talk about this. <laughs> You're not going to learn Adobe. <laughs> and he just he sat us down in front of the computer and he showed us and we're like, oh yeah, no, we're not going to learn that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that was the most challenging part, definitely. Uh, we had uh, talked to Catherine Joyce and, and local people, so we knew we used a local printer. Um, uh, Brenda was absolutely amazing. Brenda helps people with their expression and their marketing and uh, absolutely elevated the book. Um, um, that was a beautiful part, too, going back and forth with Brenda. But yeah, just Thank you. everything everything past writing. <laughs> Yes. And what about your nature as a teacher? Yeah, so nature as teacher, well, when I, um, my children were young, my two boys, um, Carter and Cole, uh, I ran a nature program for about seven years in Chelsea. Um, we backed onto some PAE land, and we, um, it just evolved very organically, and we used the forest as our classroom and nature was our teacher and we I, I created curriculum but um, so it's basically nature's teacher is you know ped pedagogical land based you know resources that I had used with the children and I used a lot of story to develop empathy for the natural world and then I would have accompanying games to go along with it and so I just gave a tiny window into that um, with nature's teacher will that book be available like at the general store perhaps that would be awesome. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. The Fairburn House, the as a library, there. Sure. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that would be lovely, and, it, and and this experience is evolving just like that, you know. Um, Jonathan Rednicki had reached out and, and done that lowdown article. We haven't initiated anything. This was launched to friends and family, and then this happened. So I um, think, like, I would love, I just need to know who to talk to, and I'd love to make that happen. <laughs> Thank you, Rosanta. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's that kind of a community. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Well, thank you, and um, uh, just so grateful, and thank you for allowing us to, taking time from your day and allowing us to be in dialogue with you today and share our process, and um, that's it. <laughs>